Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we have a nice uh, intimate crowd here today, and that, I think that's just perfect uh, for what we uh, have in store for you guys with the program. Welcome. Thank you guys for coming out here on a Saturday. Uh, my name is Jim Ryan. I'm the uh, Associate Director here at the Kevorkian Center. And this is a special program that we've been running today. This morning we had uh, a workshop uh, run by Wafa Ganayim on Tafriz and Tea. Uh, and this afternoon uh, we are having a panel. Uh, on the theme of arts, crafts, and storytelling in the Middle East. Uh, and you'll get a sense of why we titled it that way very soon. Uh, but I'm here, I'm going to introduce uh, our three speakers, uh, and then we're just going to kick things off with a, a few presentations and then a conversation. Uh, our presenters today, uh, we're very lucky to have with us Sato Mogalian, who is the author of this grand spanking new book mm -hmm. from our Redwood Press, which is part of uh, an imprint of Stanford University Press, uh, Feast of Ashes, The Life and Art of David Orhanesian. Uh, this was her grandfather, uh, who was the chief ceramicist uh, in the Armenian quarter of Jerusalem uh, in the middle part of the 20th century. Something, uh, something like something that. Something like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's uh, close good. enough, close yeah. enough. Yeah. Uh, and we, we also have with us uh, the poet uh, Zaina Hashembek. If any of you were here uh, last night, Zaina, had a poetry reading and presentation in Arabia uh, <laughs> uh, last night uh, in Arabic. Uh, today she's with us to talk uh, about her poetry in English uh, and to read uh, some of her poetry. Uh, and we also have, again, staying over from this morning, Wafa Ganayan, who is uh, an artist and uh, runs these wonderful workshops uh, both here and in Washington, D.C. now. Everywhere. And everywhere uh, on the art of Tatriz, the, the, the Palestinian uh, art of embroidery. Um, and I'm noting here we have all of their books for sale. Uh, and uh, the Tatriz and Tea book from uh, Wafa is going for $49. Uh, Sato's book, Feast of Ashes, is on sale for $20. And uh, Zena Hashembeck's most recent uh, poetry collection, Louder Than Hearts, uh, is available for $15. Uh, the last two I mentioned will take cash and Venmo. Uh, I think Wafa prefers credit cards. Uh, uh, cash or... But cash, cash, Venmo, and credit cards, okay. all the works. I mean, she, she has the card here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so without any further ado, uh, we're going to start off with Sato, uh, and then Wafa is going to present, and then Zena is going to present, and then we're going to have a conversation. Uh, if, if you needed any time to get some food, please do it. Uh, you know, we're, we're really trying to create an intimate uh, vibe here, but please join me in welcoming the South of Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for that lovely introduction, and thanks to all of you for being here. I'd like to encourage you to um, move forward if you care to, so I have a feeling of the warmth of your presence supporting me. Um, I also wanted to thank, she's not here right now, but Fidel Garfush uh, for all the work she did behind the scenes and Guy Borat for making the introduction. So I'm grateful to have the opportunity to talk about my maternal grandfather, David Ohanesian, whose life I've just written. Ohanesian was an early 20th century master of the historic Ottoman Kutahya ceramics tradition who was deported from Kutahya in early 1916 in the World War I period that we know as the Armenian Genocide. And after surviving for more than two years as a refugee in Aleppo, he recreated his ceramic art in Jerusalem in 1919. Ohanesian's life was not unique. Like countless others, he was uprooted once in 1916 and then again in 1948. But as an artist, he left many traces behind. One of them was a piece of pottery that my mother had carried through her own various displacements and occupied a place of honor in my childhood home in New Jersey. This piece of pottery, not this one, it's another one, but this can stand in for it. Uh, this piece of pottery was my own introduction to my grandfather's art as a child. And if you'll permit me, I'm gonna just read one passage from the book. In our living room, a white painted brick fireplace faced the front door. On the mantel, high above the reach of a child's hands, stood a lustrous pottery vase, about 10 inches tall, covered with a vibrant cobalt blue glaze. Even in winter dusk, light bounded from its faintly dimpled curves. Large floral medallions in green and white filled the field with stylized red carnations laced between them. 
Feathery leaves traced graceful arcs around the flowers. Turquoise and white diamond figures circled the neck of the vase, strung together with tiny knots of red glaze that piled up in relief. We never ever put flowers in the vase, and from that I learned that sometimes objects exist just to be admired. On the rare occasions my mother took it down, and the rarer occasions still when I was allowed to hold it, I was always surprised by its heft. The glassy surface stayed cool to the touch. I ran my hand along the inside and traced the smooth imprints of fingers, which had left furrows in the clay as the vase was shaped on the potter's wheel. Your grandfather made that, my mother said. David Ohanesian, her father. Baba, she called him. This was as close as I would come to touching my grandfather's hand. I had never met him. He died before I was born. But this vase, with its elegant form and dancing flowers, which had emerged so many years earlier from the ashes of a far-off kiln, survived my mother's journeys. From her native Jerusalem to Damascus, Cairo, Beirut, Alexandria, and finally, America. It was always present and watched over us. One hundred years after my grandfather's arrival in Jerusalem as a refugee, the art he founded in the Holy City in 1919 continues to flourish and is today one of the most characteristic idioms of the visual landscape of Jerusalem. Um, before I go on, how many of you have actually ever been to Jerusalem? Okay, that's a pretty decent number. Do you all remember seeing Armenian ceramics? Yeah, yeah okay. Outside the old city, if you look up, you might see some green and blue tiles nestled among the gold and Jerusalem building stone. In fact, once you start looking for it, you'll see these tiles all around. But we might wonder, how did this art come to be so present in the city? In fact, Armenian ceramics are now so well integrated into the fabric of the city that they're often used by art directors as a kind of visual shorthand for Jerusalem. Here we see Hannah Arendt's first day in Jerusalem in this 2012 film. She's sitting in front of David Ohanesian ceramics. Mm -hmm. Here's another one at the American Colony Hotel. In 1986, Yael Olenek, a curator at the Arendt's Museum in Tel Aviv, organized the first formal museum exhibition featuring the Armenian pottery of Jerusalem. She broke new ground in recognizing it as a distinct art a separate branch of the larger field of Ottoman ceramics. Since then, other Israeli and British art historians have also written about Ohanesian and the Jerusalem pottery under the British mandate. And of course, a number of Turkish and European art historians have written about Kutakya ceramics. But as I began to study the literature when I was in my 20s, I noticed that there was very little connective tissue between the story of Kutakya ceramics and that of the Jerusalem art. I was also surprised to see that significant biographical details about my grandfather were often incorrect, and almost always the story of how he arrived in Jerusalem was painfully incomplete. I came to realize that the art historians were working with the materials available to them, or in some cases, perhaps, the chronicles that they wrote of this art were crafted to align with a particular political narrative. Over the years, as I learned more about the history of this period, I began to wonder, was it simply too problematic to acknowledge that the transfer of an art from one place to another place had actually been accomplished through the deportation of its central figure? I thought perhaps it was time to fill in that gap with a more detailed telling of my grandfather's story. A few more details of his life. He was born in 1884 in an isolated mountain village of Muratja in the western part of Anatolia, which is now western Turkey. Like many rural families, my grandfather's clan maintained a strong tradition of oral storytelling. Births, deaths, marriages, professions, adventures, all of these were passed down through the generations by reciting them around the hearth, night after freezing winter night. In this way, Oenesian learned that he was in part descended from men who had traveled to the ceramic center of Kutahia to learn the art. And similarly, my mother, as a child in Palestine, also learned the stories of her ancestral family and the mountain village they inhabited for 400 years. 
In the last years of her life, in the early 1990s, she wrote down all the stories she could remember and made copies for every member of my generation. These stories are woven throughout the book. During David O'Hastin's youth, his family left the mountain village for the city of Eskishir. In 1902, he moved again to Kutahya to begin his apprenticeship. And in 1907, he opened an independent studio there. I'd like to just pause for a minute and talk about the region of Kutahya and about the ceramic tradition that David Owenessian inherited. So let's look at this map, which indicates the tectonic complexity of Northwest Turkey. Here's a satellite view of the same area. And these are the conditions that left the region rich in clays and other minerals that gave rise to the production of glazed ceramics over time. Toward the top of this, we see the, the town of Iznik, which was the chief imperial tile-making center of the Ottoman Empire. And about 100 miles to the south, we see the secondary tile-making center of Kutakya and the nearby villages that contained abundant supplies of kaolin, the soft white china clay that produced the characteristic luminous white backgrounds that we see in the finest Iznik and Kutakya ware. So here's a tile panel from the Rustem Pasha Mosque. I don't know if you can see in the screen the luminescence of the white and the brilliance of the cobalt and the red. In the mid-16th century, when coffee drinking became a rage, Kutakya artists, most of them Armenian Christians, made and exported thousands of delicate cups and saucers, and later they created several iconic Kutakya figural styles. By the early 18th century, production in Iznik had faded to near extinction, but instead huge commissions arrived in Kutakya, including orders for Jerusalem's Armenian Patriarchate and others for the decoration of palaces, mosques, and churches throughout the Ottoman provinces. You can see this is St. James Cathedral, Armenian Cathedral in Jerusalem, which I hope all of you will someday have a chance to visit. And these are beautiful 18th century Kutakya tiles. Here's another 18th century Armenian tile from the Etchmiadzin Chapel of St. James, where you see the very typical kind of naive figural style that we associate with Kutakya and the really bright palette of colors that were used at the peak of the art in the early 18th century. The repair of externally tiled monuments also provided work for the Kutakya ceramicists over the centuries. But by the middle of the 19th century, severely deteriorating economic conditions in the Ottoman Empire had left the trade subdued. A devastating earthquake in Bursa in 1855 inflicted huge damage on the city's many tiled monuments, but it did give some stimulus to the city's trade. <coughs> Two powerful Ottoman statesmen, Osman Hamdi Bey and Ahmed Refik Pasha, engaged the Kutakya artists to provide renovation tiles and also included Kutakya ware in the huge 1867 Paris and 1873 Vienna World's Fairs. By doing so, these men helped draw attention to Kutakya's reviving artistic legacy, which became a source of Ottoman national pride. New publications in the 1870s projected the beauty of the empire's greatest architectural masterpieces making them accessible to an international audience, while also locally encouraging the rise of a national architectural style. And page after page in these books depicted the diversity and the beauty of historic Ottoman tiles. In the late 19th century, Kutake workshops busily manufactured tile tabletops, vases. The artists labored to regain the refined techniques of their predecessors in the 18th century. At the turn of the 20th, the Ottoman Empire was roiled by waves of nationalism and a growing clamor for a more clearly defined Turkish cultural identity. A new architectural style emerged, one that looked back to the magnificent imperial past and fused the most distinctive components of the great Seljuk and Ottoman Islamic monuments, dough, domes, wide eaves, pointed arches, and of course, tiled facades. Here we see the 1904 Grand Post Office. It was started in 1904. Um, Mehmed Vedat Tech was the architect, and as you can see, it's covered with Kutakya tiles. Here's another work by the same 
architects and these buildings are standing in Istanbul, you know, you can see them. You'll often walk around Istanbul and see colorful tiles, which are almost always produced in Kusakia. After Onesian founded his workshop in 1907, the city boasted three major studios, one belonging to the senior master ceramist Mehmet Emin, and the other to the brothers Garabed and Hartun Minasyan. All three partnered together on large commissions. And after the 1908 Young Turk Revolution, the workshops became even busier. Part of the modernizing efforts of the regime was to form a scientific commission for repairs and construction to take care of all the monuments that had been kind of neglected in past years. The ceramicists worked closely with the director, whose name was Ahmed Kemalatin, Mimar Kemalatin, and they produced renovation tiles for buildings from the 13th through the 18th centuries. At the same time, they were producing, <coughs> excuse me, producing and exporting large quantities of pottery to Europe mostly. <coughs> in 1910, the three studios received a huge commission in Cairo for Prince Muhammad Ali Tufik's new Manial Palace complex on the Nile River. And in the same year, Sultan Mehmed Reshad, Reshad V engaged Kemal Tim to plan his future shrine. So the entire interior of this shrine is covered with Kutakia tiles that were made between 1913 and 14. In October of 1911, David Ohanesian met someone who would change the course of his life. That month, the British MP, Mark Sykes, does that name ring a bell with anyone? Yes. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna hear some good things about Mark Sykes. <laughs> he traveled to Istanbul in, in October of 1911 um, on a diplomatic mission, but during that trip, he made a detour to Kutakia. His family manor in Yorkshire called Sledmere House had recently burned to the ground, and he decided that he wanted to make a completely tiled chamber as a kind of homage to his affection for the East, where he had spent much of his life traveling. He commissioned David Ohanesian. Two years later, Sykes visited Kutakia again to check on the progress of the commission, and after seeing the tiles, he wrote excitedly to his architect, it exceeded all my expectations. It seems that Ohanesian accidentally discovered a way of making something very nearly approaching the old white, which is neither dead white nor cream, but has the bluish tinge of the white of a child's eyes. Once these tiles were installed in Yorkshire in early 1914, many visitors from Sykes' aristocratic and uh, military and British Foreign Office circle visited the rebuilt Sledmere House and admired Ohanesian's work. Chief among those visitors was a great friend of Sykes named Ronald Storrs. <coughs> this outpouring of success in Kutakia would end pretty much with the Ottoman entry into war in 1914. In December of 1915, David Ohanesin was arrested and falsely accused of engaging in revolutionary activity. In early 1916, he, his wife Victoria, and their three young children were deported from Kutakia. During the long forced march, Ohanesian contracted a near fatal case of typhus. The family reached Aleppo later in the year. British General Edmund Allenby and his army had conquered Jerusalem in December of 1917, bringing to an end four centuries of Ottoman rule. The war years had taken a terrible toll on Palestine and its people. The newly installed Jerusalem military governor, Ronald Storrs, wrote, the most urgent problem is of course food. And Jerusalem is also filling rapidly with thousands of Armenian survivors of the massacres and deportations. This is a Red Cross photo from around Easter time, 1918. At the same time, Storrs and his fellow officers, who were attuned to the needs of historic preservation, recognized the urgency of rebuilding the physical city. He recruited architects and designers from abroad and assembled a diverse group of leaders from the three religious communities to oversee town planning and rebuilding. This group was called the Pro-Jerusalem Society, and it commenced its work in September of 1918. High on the list of their challenges was the restoration of the major holy sites, especially the tile work on the Dome of the Rock. 
you can see here how badly dilapidated it was at the beginning of the 20th century. So these tiles had um, were the sort of descendants of the tiles that were put in place by Suleiman the Magnificent in the middle of the 16th century. They had to be replaced, refreshed on a regular basis as all external tiling has to be. And since Palestine didn't have the same materials that were needed to make tiles like this, people would come in, Armenians, Greeks, Persians, uh, carrying the materials, they would repair the tiles, make new tiles, and then they would go back to their home regions. So one of the experts that Storrs invited to Jerusalem was the British architect Ernest Richmond, who wrote, tiles have decayed in the past and they will decay in the future. And he asked the general question, is the method adopted in the 16th century under Suleiman of decorating the outer wall of the Dome of the Rocks in glazed tiles, is it to be continued or are we going to abandon this? Charles Ashby, another one of the invited um, designers, uh, somebody closely associated with the British arts and crafts movement, echoed the same sentiment. He hoped to introduce or revive the arts of glass blowing, weaving, and tile making as resident industries in Jerusalem. In November of 1918, Mark Sykes traveled to Aleppo to set up a British administration there. The city had recently been conquered by the British and Egyptian Expeditionary Army um, together with Arab uh, forces. Anyway, Sykes arrived in Aleppo and re-encountered Ohanesian. He had just come from Jerusalem. He knew that everybody was, everybody wanted to find a tile maker, someone who could make new tiles for the Dome of the Rock. And so he immediately connected Ohanesian with Ronald Storrs in Jerusalem. A number of other British officers who had seen Ohanesian's tiles in Sledmuir House in Yorkshire said, yes, definitely. This was a very bizarre thing. I was sitting in the National Archives in Kew in England and I found this note, this minute written on top of a foreign office report. It says, as to the new tiles which are required, Sir Mark Sykes got an Armenian to make him a tiled room at his Yorkshire place of modern tiles imitating the old Damascus tiles very successfully. If he has not been massacred in the interval, perhaps he might provide the necessary tiles. It's like, that's my grandfather you're talking about. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Ohanessian arrived in Jerusalem in late 1918. Seven months later, he traveled back to Kutahia to gather up the surviving Armenian ceramic artists and bring them and the needed materials back to Jerusalem. His old partners, the Minassians, had been deported, and his other partner, Mehmet Emin, had joined the Turkish Nationalist Army. He would be killed by Greek forces in 1922. The local Kutakia tile tradition, which had been so carefully revived at the beginning of the 20th century, became another casualty of the Great War. Oanesian returned to Jerusalem with potter Nishan Balyan, painter Mugurdjic Karkashian, and several other workers. He named his new studio on the Via Dolorosa the Dome of the tile Rock Tiles Workshop. He cooperated with Near East Relief, the American philanthropic organization, and trained scores of young Armenian orphans and then employed them in the trade. He worked with local Palestinian architects who had come to maturity under the Ottoman era, the Ottoman milieu, and he transferred to Jerusalem the same Ottoman tradition that he had practiced in Kutakia and Constantinople of exterior tile embellishment. This was something new. All new construction in Jerusalem under the British mandate was required to be made of local limestone. And these tiled decorations with deep blues and greens offered a burst of color against the golden stone. In 1921, he was commissioned to make street signs using the colors from the Dome of the Rock in three languages, as you can see, English, Arabic, and Hebrew. And the following year, Balian and Karakashian left his employ. They set up a second Armenian ceramic studio in Jerusalem. Onesin created monumental installations in the Middle East, Europe, and the United States. He participated in exhibitions, including the Chicago World's Fair of 1933. In Jerusalem, he worked so hard to attempt to preserve the historic Anatolian ceramic making techniques, even in the face of Palestine's very different geological environment. 
To the end of his career, in the 1940s, he maintained the use of a wood-burning kiln and ground his own glazes from raw materials. And over the course of his 30 years in Jerusalem, he also designed and executed architectural tile work for new structures designed by British architects. Austin St. Barb Harrison and Clifford Holiday frequently incorporated his work. His most complex pro project in Jerusalem, which someday Guy can talk about, because it's his specialty, was a um, fountain niche made of cuerda seca tile for a new museum to display the Holy Land's antiquities. In 1938, Austin St. Barb's Harrison's romantic building with soaring arches and sun-drenched open spaces and Ohanesian's Seljuk-inspired tiled fountain niche open to the public. Perhaps his most personal creation in Jerusalem may be the now badly damaged memorial altar created in 1928 for the Armenian convent of St. Savior. The altar bears a dedication tile made by Onesian 10 years after he first arrived in Jerusalem as a refugee. The inscription reads in classical Armenian, David Onesian of Kutakia in the year of the Lord 1919 established the art of ceramics in Jerusalem, and in his workshop prepared the tiles of this holy altar, dedicated at the gate of St. Savior Monastery in memory of his parents and all the deceased, in the year of the Lord, 1928, during the Patriarchate of Archbishop Yehishe Turian. Onesim continued to produce pottery and tiles in his workshop on the Via Dolorosa until the 1948 war, when he fled the violence of Jerusalem for Cairo and then Beirut, where he died in 1953. The joint Balian Karakashian workshop continued operating until the deaths of the original partners in the 1960s. Their descendants opened separate workshops, creating and exporting an ever increasing variety of work. In 1954, Marie Alexanian, a French Armenian painter, married into the family and introduced an original design vocabulary to Jerusalem tile work. The Karakashian family continues to produce beautiful pottery and tiles, preserving the traditional designs. And of course, now with the internet, you can order a kitchen backsplash, you can order pool tiling, you know, you can order like a bathroom made of Jerusalem tile work via the internet. It's an amazing thing. Other Armenian families, including the Lepagians <coughs> and the Antriasians, have also founded artisanal studios. The Sandruni brothers, Garo, George, and Harry, each one with his own shop, have also documented the history of Jerusalem ceramics and make beautiful tiles and pottery of their own. The art of Jerusalem Armenian ceramics survives and thrives from the gorgeously painted objet d'art handmade in the higher end studios to the small trinkets made in quantity for tourists. Although the glazes, designs, and colors evoke the distant past, the art itself is just one century old. Established after the losses, hardships, and displacements of the Great War, it spills forth today with a vibrant life, a transplanted and transformed branch of an old Ottoman Armenian tradition now inextricably woven into the panorama of Jerusalem. being here for almost 10 years. Um, but I founded my artistic practice, Dutsides and Tea, uh, in 2015, originally as a book project to produce the book that you now see sitting on the table outside. Um, you know, growing up, I my mother passed on the art form of Palestinian embroidery to me and my sisters, and so from a very young age, uh, the idea of this art form and the need for its preservation 
in the diaspora, particularly for Palestinians, felt very eminent and very needed. And um, so from a very young age, my mother would always talk about, oh, you know, we, we should write a book about this. And it, in two, 2015, I decided, I'm going to write a book about this, yeah. and I'm going to self-publish this book. Uh, so I received funding from the full funding from the Brooklyn Arts Council for three years in a row to complete this book and to get it published and available to you today. Um, so tzatziriz and ti. Tzatziriz is the Arabic word meaning embroidery or the ornamentation of fabric. Uh, Palestinians use many different kinds of stitching in their textile work, uh, but the cross stitch or utbat al falahi is our main stitch that we use. Um, and so is typically, you know, references that cross stitching that you see uh, on my blouse or on a thob, which is like a full Palestinian dress. The T part of tzatziriz and T is uh, more symbolic. Of course, I love to serve tea at my classes and in my lectures. But tea was really meant to represent the storytelling traditions that were encoded in our embroidery. Um, so today, my mission is, is to keep, not only preserve the practice of producing Palestinian embroidery, there's this huge culture around consuming embroidery and consuming Palestinian embroidery. And I think this is important because it supports Palestinian women in Palestine um, who, who produce this work as a means of uh, financial, uh, you know, uh, longevity for their family and so <coughs> forth. But my my uh, assertion in my artistic practice is that um, th this embroidery isn't just beautiful to look at. It's not just difficult to produce and sk requires skillful understanding of the art form to produce it. It also carries meaning, and there's storytelling. <coughs> Uh, encoded in our motifs that this 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 coding uh, uh, in our motifs is is also a dying and endangered art form that I wanted to resurrect and preserve in in my book so that's why it's so thick it's not just uh, patterns it's also the stories behind those patterns traditionally uh, pre-1948 um, you know you see uh, cleavages in terms of the motifs. And what I mean by that is that different patterns were, were utilized and produced in different villages in Palestine pre-1948. And, and they, they each village kind of had its unique sets of uh, patterns that they used. After 1948, this all changed, of course, because the women from these various villages um, who had been practicing this art form became mixed. And they ended up in the refugee camps and in the diaspora and the, in their own exile, and they practiced together. I mean, imagine sitting in a refugee camp. Doesn't matter. You're from Ramallah. Someone else could be from Safad. Someone else could be from, you know, Jerusalem. Whatever. You're all coming together to embroider. You're not thinking about, oh, you're. I need to copy patterns from someone. From, you just say, that's pretty. I'm going to copy that. So there became this sort of mixing and matching that happened with our patterns, and that kind of created this new genre of tatris, and that that is being our diaspora tatris. So another thing that I am asserting in my book is that let's look at our embroidery as a, a, a life, as something that has been um, growing and modernizing uh, for the past 70 years in our diaspora, and it deserves uh, and the attention um, of such, of this kind of art form. Art forms innovate over time, and so did Dutteris. His, you know, right now, if you look at many of the other Palestinian embroidery books out there, they really focus a lot on what village a certain dress came from. And this is, of course, very important from like an art history perspective, especially for someone who might be collecting embroidery. They're not producing it, but they're collecting, procuring, they're creating museums and exhibits. Uh, or exhibits in museums, they're going to say where they purchased that item, right? But this has narrowed our discussion about what Palestinian embroidery is and what it represents. Um, it is not just, you know, what village did this come from? It, it's a broader story about uh, what was the embroiderer trying to share with you um, through her production of it. And here's an example. This is actually in the Palestine Museum in, in Palestine. Um, this is an example of diaspora embroidery, not produced by my family, but just to give you an idea, um, where traditional motifs or even kind of newer motifs where you see 
um, various elements of, of Palestine life under occupation um, uh, sort of being brought in together on this traditional garment. And, um, you know, this is an intifada dress. Uh, this is uh, essentially a time when Palestinians uh, were uprising and Israel kind of outlawed the, the ability for them to carry Palestinian flags. It was considered a terrorist act or something. So women began to embroider dresses that embedded the Palestinian flag. Um, so this is an idea of like innovation and in Palestinian embroidery and how it's adapted to our times, not just in diaspora, but under occupation as well. But when I started my book, I wanted to focus on the embroidery that was produced in my family and by my mother. And I spent hours and hours and hours photographing embroidery, studying my mother's stitches, you can see here on the end, just trying to under, trying to take sort of a research uh, uh, perspective on the oral history to tr tradition as well as the, the practice of the art form to try to capture it and teach it and preserve it and pass it on in my book. Um, and so I did, and this, and this is the book that you see outside today. Um, but I kind of want to take a step back and give you a little bit of context of how I grew up with embroidery, uh, how my mother grew up with embroidery, and just kind of share my, my story with you today. So in this picture, you see this is 1952 in Menbej, Syria. Uh, that's about five years after the creation of Israel, after my mother and her family were exiled. This is the first generation of children in my mother's family. This is my mother right here. And what's a bit eerie, actually, about this photograph is everyone has passed away, except for my mother and my aunt here sitting on my grandfather's lap, who just fled Syria um, and uh, is in Oregon with my mother on the West Coast. <laughs> and uh, she actually has, doesn't carry embroidery traditions. She, she says she doesn't like embroidery, but she does a lot of crocheting, which is another part of our, our craft in, in Palestine as well. Um, but this is around the time that my mother learned how to embroider from my grandmother. And you can see here, this is a modern context, you know, they weren't in refugee camps anymore at this point. They had moved to Menbej, purchased a house. They are not even wearing embroidery here, which is, there are no hijabs, you don't see anything sort of traditionally. It was a modern family trying to keep this art form alive. And so my mother grew up in Damascus uh, and kind of around Syria, uh, really taking to Palestinian embroidery. I mean, my grandmother and my great-grandmother would sit and gossip while the kids were napping and talk and tell secrets and all these things. And my mother was always so curious, like, what are they talking about? What are they doing? And so when she was old enough, she immediately like began contributing within the household in terms of producing this textile art. And she grew to teach, uh, grew up to teach Palestinian embroidery in the Anurwa refugee camps um, in, uh, in um, Damascus for 12 years, actually. And even then she immigrated, when she immigrated into the United States, this is Massachusetts in 1980-ish, uh, um, she, she was still talking about Palestinian embroidery and teaching it. And so my mother really has spent a large part of her life teaching Palestinian embroidery to, United State, to the United States audience, uh, frankly, uh, after leaving the Middle East. And she also taught us, this is me, sitting with my mother. I grew up attending her demonstrations and assisting her in her demonstrations and her lectures and her classes, much like the class I did today earlier in this very room. My mother used to conduct um, over the last you know, 50 years, if you can imagine. So our curriculum is very tight. <laughs> uh, we've been, we've been um, teaching this art for quite a long time. And my mother didn't just teach me the art, she taught me how to teach the art and pass it on, which I think is is even more important. And and me and my sisters, oh, oh there's no meeting. Um, me and my sisters, this is me and my sister actually helping her with the gardens dress, wearing traditional clothing. All of this featured in the book, by the way, the patterns, everything. Um, this is I think 1988 in Holyoke, Massachusetts. <laughs> I mean, our audience was primarily, you know, 
middle class white America, and we but we worked we were showing them what being Palestinian was and what it meant to us and who we were, our identity. Um, and that's how I grew up. I grew up with my mother um, teaching this art form. Um, I want to share this video with you. This is my mother speaking, and you know, because she's such a big part of my story and is such a big part of Tutsis and Tea, I like to give her a little bit of a voice uh, in the room as well. Embroidery is part of my life. I am Palestinian, so this is my identity. I embroidered, of course, and it, it is something connected to my heart from when I was a little girl. I feel that they are like it's a, an obligation on me to teach them because they are away from their homeland. And if nobody teach them, then it will be lost. And I feel that like uh, I have. To do, uh, to do something to show who I am. This will show who I am. This kind of art, our tradition, I feel that I'm doing my duty that my mother and grandmother did with me. And so she did. She taught me, this is me, at actually at two years old, if you can imagine, <laughs> helping my mama with the threes. Wow. And yeah, and, and what's interesting about this as well is you can even see her sleeve like sort of sitting there next to me and I wear the dress that she's wearing as she sits next to me now in my events I have in my closet at home. I mean, it is, it's, it's definitely a practice. Tutsis and Tea, while it began only a few years ago, it's been going on for, for much longer with my mother. But I like in the video when she says, I want to show who I am and this is who I am. And this is the important, I think, and most beautiful and sacred aspect of Palestinian Tzatzidis and why it's become my really my life, teaching others, is that as a Palestinian, I am very much pressured to be political and to say political statements and to be an activist and to do this and that. And I love Palestine, I love Palis my Palestinian heritage and I will stand for that heritage against all odds, but I I want to, I there's this meditative component and this aspect of bringing me back to who I am when I am embroidering, and that, that isn't political, and it isn't uh, uh, related to any narrative or dominant discourse that's happening around Palestine and Israel, I, to, it's beyond that, it's just me sort of engaging in the motion, physical motion, of producing this embroidery that my ancestors did before me, that my grandmother, my grandmother, the same motion she did with her hands, I'm doing, my great-grandmother. And there's something even beyond like time, space, and place that connects me uh, with who I am um, beyond the current context. Um, so this is um, me and my sisters, I mean, we, uh, all learned together. We were all apprentices with my mother, um, and we ended up together producing. And I share the story of how this happened: producing the garden dress, which um, you know, in that previous video where you saw me and my sister kind of stitching with my mother and pulling waste canvas, um, that's where we ended up in this this shot in the nineteen. It was nineteen ninety three, I think. This is in our Oregon home. It's weird because the kitchen looks totally different now, but oh, something's very much the same. Like those plates just never moved. But um, but you know that was the gardens just before, and a couple of years later we produced the full gardens. So you can tell this is the '90s. I mean, look at the scrunchies and the hair and the weird painting in the back. Um, but we finished the garden dress, which was this monumental achievement. Me, my sisters, my mother, and. Um, this is a very traditional format for a Palestinian thobe, and, uh, and this was a very pivotal life experience for me in the production of my book, but also in, um, in, in specializing in my art form. I don't like to say craft. Craft is like a relegation to like a lower sort of primitive uh, production, uh, but this is an actual fine art form, and uh, it helps me sort of teach and kind of figure out what are the stages in teaching children uh, this art form to keep this, this art alive. 
And there's so much meaning. When I have more time, I go into the meaning and decode all this stuff for you. Um, but it's it's all available in my book, and I just kind of uh, you know want to show you a little bit, a little blurb from my classes for those that weren't there earlier. I travel the world teaching this art in these small workshop formats. I just love that table view. You're gonna count up one perforated hole and one over to the right and stick your needle through. And it should look like a forward flash. I see people producing trees and just beautiful, um, these beautiful traditional motifs uh, in really modern settings. And that's my goal. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I just came from Doha, from Qatar, teaching Palestinian embroidery to students in Qatar. I mean, people are interested in the process of producing art. And there's this uh, sort of like personal stake that they develop and and you know just a little story I was in Oregon it was sometime last year doing a workshop in Happy Valley if you guys have ever heard of it it's a small kind of retirement town in Oregon and I was doing a weekday workshops of course a lot of retirees came through and three hours into the workshop everyone was doing a great job i was just kind of walking through to say you know do you have every all the threads you need to take home to finish your project one older woman was sitting there very quietly she always looked so angry but every time i talked to her she'd smile at the end i, I walked up and said did you have a good time can i get you any thread to take home and she said yeah i had a great time who would have ever thought pakistanis do more than just kill each other <laughs> We do more than just kill each other. Um, besides the fact we're occupied and people are killing us, but um, you know we produce and we create. And she just spent three hours. I don't think she would have ever, like, honestly thought, or maybe her relatives that might have more uh, stronger political beliefs would have thought that she would have sat for three hours and embroidered with a group of Palestinians and learn a traditional art form. So it's a nice way to get people to the table and learn about Palestine in a way that they would otherwise not engage in. Um, Did she go, oh, Palestine, or she didn't even know? I mean, it's weird because it's like on my instructional pamphlet I give. It says Palestine, welcome to Palestinian embroidery. So I'm hoping if there was a click uh, at some point, but uh, no promises. <laughs> um, but uh, but that's my time today. So they, oh, did you have a question? Yes, please. The garden's dress. Yes. Where did you get the base dress? Where did you get the dress? It was tailored actually. My mother uh, just had fabric and, and embroidered on fabric and then assembled it together at the end. You know, it took 11 years to produce that dress. Um, so normally the assembly and final tailoring of a dress happens at the end because you never know how long it'll take you to make the dress. Uh, so she was, you know, it was good. We were able to tailor it right to her body. Um, but you can get pre-made dresses uh, anywhere. And as long as it's not stretchy, the fabric's not stretchy, you can embroider on it. Yeah. What, what type of material was the dress, the, the, the base dress? I was like, uh, it, it's nothing fancy. It was like a polyester mix. It, it wasn't anything fancy at all. Um, but uh, but it was it was fabric that she got from Jordan because she she later in, uh, lived in Jordan. Um, but yeah, you can you can get most of it. But just a really quick note: if uh, you're not able to pick up the book today. Um, I wanted to extend a discount to people who go on my website. I'm self-published, so uh, the promise of continuing this work depends on my ability to fund it. Um, but NYU Tutsidies is the promo code to purchase. So thank you very much for your time. Did you have an additional follow-up? Yes, okay. The, the material you did in the class, it has like a, a rectangle. It has a specific holes. Yes. That's just for learning, right? It's not, I mean, you don't use that in the actual production. No, you can. Uh, Ada cloth, A-I-D-A -A cloth. It's a cross-stitch fabric. You can find it on Amazon. Um, this is a nice portable way. 
So uh, some pe women will embroider it and uh, sew it onto the dress, and then if they want to pass the dress down to the next generation and they're a different size, they can like move the embroidery onto a different dress or or, or whatever. So it's it's nice portable fabric. Yeah. Did you make your blouse? I didn't. I got this. This is from a uh, maker in Ramallah. Yeah. But it's a, I liked it because it, it's all the different motifs I teach in the class, like birds and the trees and the reishi and the everything. Yeah, yeah, I love this. Uh, it's like a chest design, but on a blouse. So, yeah. And are we taking more questions? At the I, end? I think we can take more questions at the end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Great. I all. You're next. This is. Um, do you yeah. need to connect to the other? Uh, I don't. I don't even have a laptop actually. I'm just going to move this on. Oh, this is yours. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Take this out. Take? Oh, yeah. sorry. There we go. Oh. 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 Presentations, I really enjoyed them. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jim, for making this happen. Fidel, everyone here, I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, if you see that I sat down in a few minutes because I'm a little bit sick, I'm tired, but I'm going to. I usually do my poetry standing up, but if I lose energy, I'll sit down. So, um, let's see. So I want to start since you know. Uh, both of you talked about you know family and family stories and uh, what what is passed on uh, with a very short poem in in my book uh, that my mom uh, sort of can't believe I put this here. Uh, she called me. She's like, you actually put this story. Here. It actually happened. Uh, it's called Pizza with Light Bulb. Mama made the best Arabic pizza. Soft, thick, with olives, mushrooms, a shawain cheese, ketchup instead of pizza sauce. But that night, there was something different about it. We knew one should never complain about homemade food. So we crunched and swallowed, washed it down with Pepsi, until she heard the glass shards under our teeth. She opened the oven, found out the light in there had burst. The doctor on the phone said the only side effect would be our asses lighting up at night. <laughs> it was a practical thing, after all, to turn into lightning bugs with the electricity gone from midnight until 6 a.m. <laughs> so, it's, uh, uh, you know, I never start on this one, but I just discovered today it's a cool one. It's to start a good on. one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, I think that I think a lot about, and I talked uh, about it yesterday. So, if some of you were here yesterday and you you hear similar poems, the same poems, sorry, and the same like talk, uh, I'm very much obsessed with uh, languages or the intersection of the languages that I, I live in. You know, I um, grew up in Lebanon, so my first language is Arabic, uh, my second language was French, and English I learned at the age of, of 12, so I always, this is an obsession of mine in, in my writing, uh, how to write into that liminal space, uh, this in-betweenness of, of languages. Uh, and this is a, a ghazal, it's the first poem in my book, one of the last that I wrote for this book. If you don't know who Sheikh Imam is, Sheikh Imam was a, an Egyptian singer and composer who often um, sang the colloquial Egyptian poetry of po poet Ahmad Fuad Negm, and it was very heavy political satire. This is broken ghazal, speak Arabic. I write in English the way I roam foreign cities full of street light and betrayal until I find a coffee shop that speaks Arabic. If we were born in the cities we long for love, Paris, Prague, New York, 
What languages would they have taught us to speak? Arabic says the best singers are the peddlers. And the Quran, would it still lift us if it didn't speak Arabic? Sure, there is always lemon. But I wonder if we would have found Sheikh Imam, who reminds us the wound is awake and love speaks Arabic, who reminds us no one can colonize a river, and the tyrant is always afraid of the poet, especially if she speaks Arabic. They say people who grow up in two languages have stronger memories, and they can hear the birds on the balconies speak Arabic, and they know a mountain of orange life jackets looks like spring, though it won't revive the dead, the dead who speak Arabic, but no longer need a visa or translation. And you, Zena, what else can you do but whisper to these broken lines, speak, speak Arabic. Um, another obsession of mine writing this book was uh, music. Um, and so uh, a, lot, a lot of poems here are tributes to uh, thought up singers I grew up listening to, like Um Kulthum, Abdul Halim, uh, Warda. I did the Um Kulthum and Abdul Halim yesterday, I think, because I see some of you were, were here yesterday. I'll vary it and I'll do, I'll do the one that refers to Warda. This is a poem that is um, titled after one of her songs, Fiyum Wilila. I guess it would translate as in a day or a night, and a night, Fiyum Wilila. Spare me this Arab love for dictators tonight. Come closer, listen. Warda is singing, Fiyum Wilila. This day, this night, let us push this talk of the land to the side. Spare me this Arab love for conspiracy tonight. Lower your voice to the sound of my pupils. Look at me. Let's music instead. Let's cigarette. Let's wine and laughter. Let's call friends. Remember how our mothers used to serve cigarette packs on trays to their guests? Fi Malboro, Fi Viceroy, Fi Gitan, they said. Every house had them, cigarette trays. Some nights, the politics settled with the ashes and the jokes came, the clapping, the Allah, Allah, rising with the smoke, the dancing. Time tortures everyone. Let's heal a little. Ask me if I could ever love again. Let's exaggerate. Ask me if there will ever be arms like mine. Werda is singing. She'd been missing you long before she'd met you. I missed you before I met you too. And now, Habibi, even more. Even more. Um, I grew up in uh, the north of Lebanon, in a city called Tripoli, Lebanon, and uh, I think a lot of poems that sort of led to me writing and finishing this book came from uh, August 2013. Uh, I, we return to Lebanon every summer. We live in Dubai, we return, return to Lebanon every summer, so we were there, and um, there were, in August, there were two massive uh, mosque explosions in, in Tripoli. Uh, and, and that very harsh summer led me to, to write about this, but I didn't just want them to be grief poems. I also wanted them to be celebration poems. Uh, this, is, this is kind of like one of these celebration poems. Uh, and it's titled, My Non-Arabic Lover and I Take the Train. We took a train to Prague tonight. I kept saying Orloj and Kafka, and you said we too sweet on arrive. I'd never been on a train before. Held on to my ticket, looked out the window, couldn't sleep. When the wheeled creatures talked, we stepped down, found ourselves in my hometown of Tripoli. I saw my father 
crossing a street with his friend, ran into his arms. He said he was going to buy new shoes. I saw my mother, who told me she cut her hair short by herself, had nothing to lose anyway after what happened. I saw my old school bus stop next to the cafe where it used to drop me, saw Besma step out, still 13. All the time I gasped, smiled, said hello, my heavy northern accent sinking back into my tongue. You followed silent, watch the map of me unfold, grow rivers and strange names and temples. This way I showed you, my arm like a small bridge. This place, the best fete in town, explained how it was made of chickpeas, bread, yogurt, tahini. You asked me about the armed men in the street and I told you, there was melted G on top of it. There were roasted pine nuts. I could already taste it. Mm. Um, I'm going to read one of my duets. Uh, the duet is a form that uh, I made up and um, have been experimenting with recently. So in, in this book, uh, you can see a few Arabic words, Arabic, express Arabic expressions that sort of weave their way into uh, my poetry. The duet, in the duet, the Arabic is a more equal partner to the English. It's a purely bilingual poem. And the idea is, if you know only Arabic, you have an, a poem in Arabic on the page. If you know only English, you have a poem in English on the page. And if you know both, then you kind of read like that across the, you know, alternating languages. Hopefully a third dimension opens up from the conversation between the two. And um, they're not, the poems are not <coughs> translations of one another, but there are a few ra uh, lines that echo each other, that are translated. In some poems, they're translated, but there's a not, that, like, there's a negation of one. So it's, it's saying, this, it's saying the, the exact opposite. One language is saying the, op the opposite of, of the other. So just a taste of the duets. This is... Uh, for a poem written for the Mediterranean Sea, uh, specifically in Beirut, called Blue Azraq. Nara al Bahra wa la narahu illa fil manam. A patch, a glimpse among the antennas, aw min bain al shultani ala al astah. How to brave this blue? La Bahra lana huna wa la quwa. Sometimes I forget the sea is this. لنا حب قديم يريد أن يحفر لك في الإسمنت شاطئا My love, I want to dig a beach for you out of this cement لنا مطر محمل تارة بعطش الأرض وتارة بعفن الشارع O oh, old faith and new O oh, time of wells and time of satellite dishes لنا الحر والرقص على ظهور المباني قد نرى بقعة بحر من هناك. Are the fish still edible? Our nets are full of plastic and trash. لنا كأس تجري فينا كنبع صغير ننسج فيه سماء وغروبا ونجوما وتراتيلا. My parents threw me in the sea when I was two and I floated. They called me little fish. My parents trusted the sea more. إلهنا الأزرق لم نعد نعبده وما زلنا نحبه. Oh, blue god, we no longer worship, but still love. لما لا نتذكر البحر إلا عندما تموت العصافير على الشرفات. Over breakfast, I had to convince a friend Beirut was still on the Mediterranean. لمن ندون أحلامنا كل صباح Are you sure? he asked Is it a deep, bluest blue? ما أجمل الموت بلا ضرائح Yes, I said No, I said ارفعني على كتفيك قبل أن نحرق المدينة Lift me on your shoulders Roll in the tires Light them up Oh city, we no longer love 
but still worship. لقد أقسمنا أن نقلع عن عبادتي هذه المدينة. Um, I'll do two more. Um, this one I'll do because uh, I'm in New York, and this actually happened in Beirut. Uh, you'll see. Everything here is an absolute. Look at where this nostalgia has brought us. We go down the stairs and order frozen margaritas. It's been years since we've lived in this city. The waiter shows us our table, hopes we don't mind two American boys sitting with us. There's no space for them elsewhere in this small cabaret. We say we don't mind. We are used to this city of small spaces into which everything fits. The American students are our age, about a decade ago. They tell us their names and I decide to call them Ahmed and Faisal. They agree. As the performers go on stage, as the songs and smoke rise, we raise a toast and Ahmed and Faisal smile and clap non-stop. They've even learned the Arab shoulder shimmy. Once I've margaritaed enough, I start explaining song lyrics. She's warning him he will regret and it's no disaster if he leaves. And yes, motor is pronounced motor. And suddenly, I discover I don't really know who Zain Abidin is, though I've been singing for him all my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah needs no interpretation. Neither do the colorful costumes and feathers and all this going back in time. I want to shout, no one eats hummus with carrots. <laughs> and, no one, and no one calls this pita bread. It's just bread. Chubs. Because everything here is an absolute. Faisal says, thank you. And I remember one expression for thank you is, may your hands be safe and sound. And then I ask, doesn't Beirut remind you of New York? His silence is polite. To which I argue, there are no fire escapes here, but there could have been. Some cities burn faster than others. I Beiruted East Houston when I first saw it, and my friend disagreed and said streets were making me delirious again. What I mean is, if you write your name on a wall and find it gone, you say my name has left, would you feel abandoned? Would you trace it again? What I mean is, there are songs where the fallen don't have rope enough to climb out of wells. And there are songs where lovers return and the night happens. I, I'm going to end on a, yeah, on a praise poem, I guess. Um, this was written for Sur uh, Lebanon uh, in August 2018. And it's called Morning Prayer. Thank you, God of coriander and spicy potato. Thank you, peeling wooden rails. Thank you, God of sea foam. Thank you, red buoy bobbing on the water surface. Thank you, rock island in the distance. Thank you, statue of Our Lady of the Seas. Thank you, harbor. Thank you, Sama on the tomato placenta. Thank you, blackberry jam on the peach flesh. Thank you, fumes of the motorbikes. Thank you, sombrero on the public beach. Thank you, newborn baby in the balcony of your mother's arms. Thank you, fat man with the cross tanning on the plastic chair. Thank you, drenched clothes of the clotheslines. Thank you, flip-flop girl shouting curses across the alley. Thank you, Mary of the small glass shrine. Thank you, seagulls. Thank you, horizon. You are the goddess. Thank you, cigarette butts. 
Thank you, broken sh ship wheel on the seaweed stairs. Thank you, full lipped cashier. Thank you, God of silicon and hyaluronic acid. Thank you, God of the sun. Thank you, God of the bed sheets. Thank you, supermarket doorway grandma with the braided hair. Thank you, girl behind the phone camera, searching for the God angle of your friend's face. Thank you, hairs of my husband's beard. Thank you, dough of my hips. Thank you, old flag in the wind. I hello you too. Thank you, songs of the colors on the walls, on the doors, on the shutters. Thank you, waves with your ceaseless shh, shh. Thank you, stones of the fortress. What have you seen? What have you seen? Little boat, little boat, goodbye. Little world, little world, I love you. Mm. You guys don't want to take a seat and we can have yeah. a conversation with everyone, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll make sure these uh, wires are out of here. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank
period in time. You know, the, 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 you know, it, it takes a little bit of doing, knowing who produced things, where they came from. It takes still digging around in archives and contextualizing things from textual sources. But I mean, it, this is very obvious in the uh, uh, Tatris in the diaspora, and, and in that process you describe of people coming from different places and mixing styles and mixing stories in that way. Yeah. But it's, I think it's also present in the way that the ceramics change so rapidly once Ohanasin arrives in Jerusalem, and the, 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 as the uh, craftsmen change hands, and new techniques are introduced, the, the painting is introduced at a later date. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm wondering, uh, you know, it, if you know the text that you guys are you're producing, or the texts that uh, you saw, like how how did how did you come around to centering the stories in the text themselves and let, let them speak for themselves in your own work beyond every, all the storytelling that happens around? Yeah, I think for the you know, so like my gra my grandmother even. Very, you know, she passed away, but my grandmother didn't learn how to read or write in school. So uh, she even, you know, she, even up until her generation, she used it as this language of its own. And I think, um, I think the way that I started uh, in sort of focusing, and I don't know if this is exactly addresses your question, is, but um, is that I focused really on like iconography. So what? kinds of symbols were embedded that could serve as a starting point is that what I wanted was that people who saw Palestinian Tatris could pick up a piece of fabric and say, oh, I know where to start in decoding this. I don't know who the embroiderer is. Maybe I'll never know. But I could learn about her story or the story through these symbols. And it kind of unraveled from there because the moment I started to look at the symbols and the stories, like the story of Cleopatra, for instance, we have a design for, um, totally lost in history. I mean, I haven't found it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And once I started to break down the sy symbols, then it was like, well, what do the history books say about this, actually? I don't even remember. And, it's, and it started to kind of build its own text uh, that way. Oh, if you had, if so yeah, I mean, um, <coughs> in the book, there's actually quite a lot about how people received, how characters in the book, especially my grandfather, like received uh, tile work from various periods, um, how he received instruction from it um, as a visual field and as a tactile object, and. Um, you know, in this period, in this period of like sort of rapid revival before the First World War, uh, where he and his partners in Kutakia were going around and examining at close range, like just hundreds and hundreds of monuments from the 13th century to the 18th century, studying like how thick were the tiles, what kind of, um, how did they affix them to the monuments, like what what the what was the weather like how many earthquakes were there. So there were layers and layers of meaning like embedded in the tiles. And then of course, not the least of which is what materials did those tile makers have access to? Were they themselves separated from their native places and you know the exact form of their native art? So um, I think I, I should probably say that it wasn't just you know looking for ways to fix the errors and gaps, but I mean, I spent my whole life before that in museums not even consciously necessarily realizing that I needed to know who I was and where I came from, but you know, I would just go from museum to museum as I was on tour as a musician, like photographing all the tiles, photographing the title cards, and then you know, looking at them again and again. Um, so for my grandfather, the Rustem Pasha Mosque was like a towering thing in his life. Like he constantly talked about it. It was like he Rustem Pasha Mosque itself became an uncle or something like that. I mean, even so much so that my mother was constantly talking about the Rustam Pasha Mosque. So his first encounter with it in the book, I mean, I spent a lot of time <coughs> talking about it, but it's that white, you know, that luminous quality, which is the product of so many different things. The right materials, the environment, you know, 
the, the, the crashing together of tectonic plates, the mm -hmm. water, you know, the, the clay, like all these things come together in this one sort of like perfect example of tile work. And for him, it was something that always remained in his mind and he just worked studiously in every place he was to try to recreate that ideal. May I ask a question? Um, what fascinated me was that he survived the genocide, but his work, what we saw, is ethnic art. It's still back home. He didn't try to create something new, a new identity that, um, on the other hand, what he did, he perfected the art which was already back home. And Whatever we saw, it's it's beautiful. It's it's what what was there, but he he did it very well. And for me, somebody who survived, perhaps he would have thought about creating something new, new identity, mm -hmm. because of the genocide, for example. Well, he Yet did he, actually. Mm. He did. I mean, um, he. He started in Jerusalem making works that were inspired by Armenian miniature okay. illuminations. And he started uh, embedding Christian symbolism into his work yes. in a way um, <coughs> from other art sources and from the page. Um, and I, I see in various private collections like examples yes. of this. He, he, so I wouldn't say that he didn't try to create anything new. Um, there's, there are examples in the book and also examples that yes. didn't reach the book, but um, I think he were, you're right, having survived the genocide, it was like um, he wanted to keep his art alive. Mm -hmm. So I think you're, you're very right in that observation. But you will also find that once he was in Jerusalem, he opened up a new iconography. I have a question to the sofa. Yes. Uh, my question is that um, it's wonderful that you're doing all these workshops in the USA, and the, the art that that you're teaching are children embracing it. Are there places that here people work this art, or this art is alive because of back home people are working? Where are we now? Well, I see. Uh, a huge interest in Tatsuri's in just the sheer fact that I'm traveling almost every week or every other week to somewhere new, not just in the US, but like Canada yes. and Qatar, and we're talking about Abu Dhabi next time. So I mean, it's just, it's starting to organically, uh, you know, gain that momentum. And I see that there's an interest in preserving the art and learning the art. I also see the fear setting in people's eyes as they sit in the workshop and realize what do they have to do when they thread the needle and everything. But then I also see that kind of wash away for a moment when they start to get very into it and obsessed. So um, youth, I, I'm not doing as many youth classes as I'd like. Most of my classes are on an adult level, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that that like momentum continues because a lot of what this work has been is just very organic. I, yes. I have no big voice, big company behind me. It's naturally okay. yes. growing thanks to Instagram and other social media yes. platforms. So I see a stronger interest now than uh, in learning actually how to do it, not just in consuming it from the 80s and 90s when I was helping my mother and my mother was sharing this art form. So um, I don't know if it's like this resurgence or this uh, like uh, form of uh, like resistance uh, just by, just through art that we're seeing because of the way things have intensified for Palestinians over the years, um, like with the occupation and everything. But I, I do see that, that there is a strong emergence of, of, of of people saying, we need to bring this here, we need to learn it, we need to continue it when you leave. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a historical question about the Nadia. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had another uh, author give a presentation about uh, a famous uh, feuding family.
Was that David Gutman by any chance? Which one? Was it David Gutman by any chance? Oh, the author? Yeah. M might have been. Uh, uh, are you familiar with these families? Those families, no. I'm familiar with the idea that, uh, I mean, it, at a certain point in the Ottoman Empire, people couldn't leave legally, and so some people resorted, according to one author, but, but I haven't really read that anywhere else, resorted to uh, uh, subterfuge to, to leave. You mentioned, though, that your grandfather went back to Kutahia briefly in the period in between well, what would have been the Independence War or the, the Turkish That's right. uh, Greek War in 19 August 19 of 1919. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I want to know how he did that, when he did that, so and what exactly he was he, left with. <laughs> he, appro he approached the British because he said, I need materials, and he also wanted to bring you know, the remaining Armenians like out. Mm -hmm. um, he approached the British. The British had, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? It's it's in the end notes. Uh, in, in Cairo, who was the director of security, who petitioned the uh, government in Constantinople, which was occupied by the Allies at that point, to provide a letter of safe passage for a safe transit document for Onesian. And they also wrote to Kutahia to the Mutasarif and, and asked um, him to cooperate in providing materials for the repair of the Dome of the Rock. So he went armed with these two documents. He traveled back by train, took the whole family with him, actually. And he wasn't there for very long. He was there for a few weeks. Um, most of his stuff was gone. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, it was the British who arranged the travel documents. Mm -hmm. But even at the time, I mean, you know, Izmir is invaded by the Greek army in May, 